Hello, and welcome to the ACOM coding and classification for the Occupational Medicine Office webinar. Today's program explores what issues need to be considered when choosing CPT codes to characterize services rendered to workers' compensation patients, including the nature of documentation required to support their use. The basis for ICD diagnostic codes will also provide as well will be provided as well as impending changeover from the ICD-9 to ICD-10. The ICD-10 represents an entirely new system of diagnostic coding and medical practices should begin to you should begin to plan now for mandatory changeover on October 1st, 2013. Planning strategies will also be discussed on today's program. Today's program is being recorded. There is 1.5 hours of CME and MOC credit for this program. You receive the verification form with today's instructions, or you can follow the link that was in the instructions. No certificates will be sent to you, but your transcript to this and other ACOM educational programs can be viewed and printed from the ACOM website. Members and non-members can both view their transcripts directly from the website. Today's program will consist of approximately 75 minutes of lectures with questions at the end. We will address questions as time permits and suggest that you submit your questions early for consideration. We are only accepting questions electronically. On the screen, you can see how to open the question box in order to submit your questions. This was also in the PDF file of your handouts you received with the instructions. We are very fortunate to have as today's presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Genovese and Dr. Paul Darby. Their brief biographical sketches are included here. On behalf of the pre presenters and planning members, we would like to disclose that Dr. Paul Darby is employed at the Franciscan Occupational Health and Support Clinic, as well as owner of MD PhD Services where he does speaking and consulting. He is for ACOM, AMA, CPT advisor. His expenses are covered and serves on the FHS Medical Research Evaluation Committee and on the board of the research center. There are no other disclosures to be made. So it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Elizabeth Genovese. Dr. Genovese, you may begin. All right, I'm gonna start by basically you know, doing the coding part, I'm going to give you a little bit about how you use the ICD-9s, um, and then I'm going to go more into the CPT codes afterwards. Paul is going to basically give you a 10-minute introduction to the ICD-10 system, and I hope in the future to be able to, you know, in my lecture, um, be talking about what ICD-10 codes to use for what. But right now, since we're, you know, Looking forward to using this book but are not using it yet, it's a more practical use of my time to be telling you how to use the ICD-9 codes as a way of getting the best from your coding experiences as opposed to how you use codes that really are not in widespread use at this point, but again are going to be. First of all, there's some pretty obvious stuff I'm putting in the beginning here. And you know, by the way, I need to tell you all, I have a lecturing style where I assume you know how to read or you wouldn't be here. I assume you can see or you wouldn't be on the computer. And I like giving people as much information as they can get for their dollar. So there will be certain portions along these slides where I'm, I am not going to sit here and read you my slides. I'm going to talk about them. There will be certain situations where I give you lists of useful codes or what codes to use when, and I am not going to spend the time explaining them to you because, quite frankly, if I were to do so, this would not be a one-hour-plus lecture on my part. It would be a three-hour lecture, and I don't think any of us want to invest that kind of time in it. Anyhow, so as you can see, the reason why we code is to tell someone what we did so we can get paid. But in addition, there are a lot of people who like to use code to figure out what the service mix is being generated by their clinic, to compare what different doctors are doing in terms of productivity, 
like who's coding high, who's coding low, who's supposed to be getting paid, and also to track the kind of diagnosis mix that's going through your code, your clinic rata, which is something that happens with the ICD-9 codes. Um, there are three kinds of codes, the CPTs, the ICD-9, and there's also a volume three of the ICD-9, which is basically about patients. In essence, the CPT code says what you're doing, the ICD-9 code supports why you're doing it, and, the IC and uh, again, the other one is inpatient. Um, there are a lot of errors made when people start doing coding for occupational medicine because, quite frankly, and this is an issue that we've been struggling for years, I was president of the coding committee at one point, Paul is now, and there isn't very much interest in the powers that be in changing this, and that E&M you know, e codes are not understood or not appropriately applied to occupational medicine. And there are ways you really can apply it to our field in particular. Um, there's a choice of incorrect patient category. People may use their modifiers poorly. They may not use, they may use codes that are not EM. And EM means evaluation and management codes poorly to supplement what they're doing. Um, they may not choose the right ICD-9 codes. Um, well, they may not choose enough of them, and that seems to be trivial. But, you know, when an insurance carrier gets a piece of paper and a diagnosis and a high CPT code with one ICD-9 code supported versus five, and the five all seem reasonable, they're obviously going to be a little more inclined to pay you what you're asking if you've got more ICD-9 coding involved. And also, a lot of times, the CPT visit codes are not properly linked with the diagnoses that are involved. So I believe the solutions are, first of all, you've got to understand the ICD-9 codes. And quite frankly, as I was telling Sandy, what I did in preparation for this lecture, and I'm waiting to do it for ICD-10, actually, when I can do it there, I actually had a nice little jaunt to the ICD-9 coding book, and I really specifically looked for codes that I thought were, um, that pertain to occupational medicine, that could be used um, as part of the coding to delineate services that we do in terms of explaining the different spectrum of diseases that we see. And the ICD-9-10 is going to have more of these and to just tell you what they are. I also wanted to point out that there are lots of times why every, you know, everyone thinks they should get coding to as many digits as they can, and that is the case. But a lot of times, at least putting a generic diagnosis out there, isn't worse because part of what we say in occupational medicine is don't come to a diagnosis and brand somebody with a diagnosis unless you know that that diagnosis is correct. Because otherwise you're basically giving them a diagnosis that's going to affect their future care, affect what, future, you know, affect what goes on with them that may in the end be inappropriate. I want you to understand the e and and CPT codes and use them aggressively and you have to remember that your record should always support your coding. I always work on the assumption when I write out a visit, and I still see a lot of, I still see private patients, so I don't do as much Ahmed anymore. I always work on the assumption that every single um, bill I put in, that someone may decide to ask for the progress note, and look at my progress note, and make sure that the records support my coding. And you should be doing that too. Um, again, one of the problems we have when we start looking at Ahmed is that a lot of the OEM-related diagnoses are not in the ICD-9. The other problem, and this is a huge problem, is that workers' compensation care requires services that are not specifically described in the CPT manuals. And we've really been struggling to deal with that in terms of at a CPT level for quite a while, and they really at some levels. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse my cynicism, but I was doing this longer than Paul, to really care less, and the same is true of other occupational medicine services. Um, furthermore, states, another huge problem we have is that states differ in how they reimburse for workers' compensation-related services. Specifically, some states have very, very generous fee schedules. In fact, they have such generous fee schedules based upon their own internal coding or a set of codes like A, B, C, D, it doesn't matter what they do. Workers' compensation is a state, not a national product, 
that those doctors really could care less what you do to the CPT system because they're just going to say code 1, code 2, code 3, code 4 and get a very nice chunk of change for what they're doing. Um, you have to bear with me for one second. I didn't bring water with me here and I really need to have a glass of water. Just wait for a second. I'll be right back. Actually, this bottle of water, it was all, ten, it was all ten steps away from me, but ten steps wasn't doing me very much good. One second. By the way, I'm, and, and I will just, if, if the answer to this is no, I do want to make sure that people can hear me. If that's a problem, please let me know, all right? I'd rather know it on slide 13 than slide 120. Um, okay. And furthermore, insurers. Um, themselves differ in their reimbursements for certain types of OM services, even when there are applicable CPT codes. So it's not as if we're throwing this whole situation into a system that has the type of uniformity that one would like to see. Um, so, okay, here you are. You're seeing a patient or you're going to see a patient and you're going to code for a patient and you have to make your first decision, which is who are you? And I'm not talking about an existential decision here. I'm talking about, are you a doctor, are you a nurse, are you uh, in the emergency room, are you outpatient, inpatient, what are you doing, and that's the codes. And again, why are you doing it are the ICD-9 codes. All right, uh, ICD-9 CM codes. Again, please, if there's a problem with sound, someone, Sandy, whatever, please let me know this. Okay, ICD-9 codes, what are they and why are they important? Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically they were developed by the World Health Organization, so they're not just used in the United States, they're used in internationally, and they're basically used by all commercial insurers who provide outpatient care in the United States, with the exception, again, of unique type situations, like state fee schedules, et cetera, because, again, workers' compensation does live in its own little world. Um, why do we bother? Well, I explain why you're doing something. Um, when you look at the ICD-9 codes, especially if you code very thoroughly and explicitly, you can really start looking at the statistics of who you're seeing. If you put them into your hospital system, for example, you can see how the population breaks down by diagnosis. As you can see, there are some cool codes that will let you see how your population breaks down by what it was that got them there in the first place. You can see what your provider mix is. We talk about this all the time. Certain providers may, may be taking more time because their, you know, their injuries have, their patients have more complex illness. You can also use it for treatment analysis, saying, okay, with this code A, why is Dr. B doing CDE and why is Dr. C doing DEF? And they can, again, this is what I think is very important in terms of coding, they can, they can convey complexity, and hence, as a proxy, they can really convey how much work we may have done. If you're here, the HIC, the 1500 form, it's the form that goes to health insurance um, claimer, you know, to health insurance departments, et cetera. I've uh, um, circled, I guess you could say, or squared. Two different parts. The two parts are on the very top. You'll see, I know this is very small, but you can see it well enough. There's four numbers, one, two, three, four, and next to it there's a line. And then there are diagnosis codes that run down the right side in that red box. What basically happens here is that the doctor picks four ICD-9 codes that go up on the top and then ties those diagnoses with CPT codes, which go on the far left, just give the insurer a sense of what code is going with one diagnosis. And since I'm someone who tends to go ICD-9 code crazy, because I love them, you know, my struggle is always the fact that I need to keep my codes down to four. On the other hand, there are some of you who are hard pressed probably to put one there sometimes. And I think that a lot of times if you're seeing someone more complicated, You've really got to make sure those numbers up on top, that one, two, three, four, are written down the side with accompanying CPT codes that help somebody, even without looking at your patient, know what you did for the person and why. 
All right. Um, I'm not going to do this sort of boring, so I'm just going to ha have you know to read it. Basically, this is how the book is divided. The idea is, in general, you get three digit codes for each category. Then there are further four and five digit codes. Um, it said that you must code at the highest level of specificity. The problem, however, is a lot of times the highest level of specificity begins to not really accurately identify what's going on, and that's why at one point I said it's okay to stay lower because if you're if you're trying to pick something that's more specific and it's really not accurate to the situation at hand, you're really not helping anybody, including yourself, because you're not providing accurate information. There is also something in the book called the V codes for health factors. V codes generally, but not always, um, cannot be the primary um, ICD-9 code. There's also something called E codes. And they're used for external causes, and they basically tell you how a given ex um, they usually list external causes that might be the reason for the ICD-9 code for which you're treating someone. And here's a little example of the three versus five code situation. And as you can see, when you go from 250 to 250.13, you've learned a lot. Um, I guess you could also split them up into separate disease processes you know, ketoacidosis and uncontrolled type 1, but in some ways by putting them all together this way, what the insurer knows is that, okay, this patient right now has both of these things going on, and they're all problematic together. Um, I mentioned to you that the book is organized into different diseases or conditions. As I mentioned earlier, you can all read as well as I can, and you can see by looking at the left side that there are a number of different categories. Um, a lot, some of these will have minimal or no relevance ever to Ahmed, but there's always some, for example, complications of pregnancy, childbirth, and the perperium may be seen in terms of a pregnancy complication when you have a pregnant worker who has a problem. Um, congenital abnormalities, I'm not really assuming is going to be a big problem for most things, including I'm also not expecting that certain conditions originating in the perinatal period are going to be a problem. On the other hand, and this is due to some other lectures I give, you know, I always say do not code a diagnosis if you don't have a diagnosis, code what the person is presenting with in terms of symptoms. And that's why I find these sections 780 to 799, symptoms, signs, and ill-defined conditions as very useful. Uh, injury and poisoning is another very useful section, obviously to the extent that we're seeing people who have injuries and poisoning. Another really fun place to look for ancillary codes that I think provide a lot of additional information to the insurer about what's going on are those V codes, V01 to 82. Some of them are just things about the administrative condition that you're under, but a lot of other ones really are telling you why the person is there or what other things that might not be immediately apparent are affecting his or her presentation to you. And I told you before, e-codes are kind of what happens to you. Um, I mentioned already, specific codes must be used, when to use the um, diagnosis codes, and when to use the v-codes. And then in general, but not always, v-codes are used when there's no disease or injury, and they're just classifying why the person is coming in to contact with the health services, but it also means, it also states rather, that the classification of factors influencing health status, which in essence means that we'll have a listing here as well of what might be influencing how someone's doing in response to the treatment that you're providing him or her. Um, the guidelines say, do not code for viable, suspected, ruled out, or questionable diagnoses. This seems to be a little bit of a contradiction to what I just said previously about you must describe symptoms, complaints, et cetera. What they're basically saying is uh, don't give a rule. You know, if someone ha might have hypothyroidism, I'm sorry, I'm in my internal medicine head today. You basically don't say rule out hypothyroidism. You give the symptoms, hair loss, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, hypothyroid, you know, whatever symptoms the person has that may lead you to think 
he or she has hypothyroidism, but you don't make the diagnosis. If a chronic condition is having an impact on the patient from time to time, then you code chronic disease repeatedly. For example, a diabetic may be uh, having a situation where his or her diabetes is going to be continually affecting the care decisions that you make. Um, you should code all coexisting conditions if they require or affect care. And again, if there's historical information of relevance, Use your V10 to 19 codes, history of colon cancer, history of this, history of that. And sometimes it might be a family history factor of relevance that you're using. But if you think it's going to have an influence on what goes on in terms of patient treatment, they should really be there somewhere. Um, there are, um, I mentioned previously, you either code something as one large five-digit code, or you can sometimes use a combination of codes if it fully identifies the diagnostic conditions present. And um, if you're going to do that, um, in essence, I'm sorry, I got something about it. So I got this pop-up and I wanted to make sure it wasn't you all popping up on my screen. And basically, uh, in a situation where the code itself perfectly describes what's going on with the person, you know, use that, take care of two diagnoses. Um, but again, only when it's wholly appropriate for the situation at hand. E codes. There are E codes that talk about immediate situations versus late effect. Um, there's a full range of codes, and if you have room on your paper, and you may not, and certainly you don't want to go cover the whole thing with E codes and then not use V codes or your CBT codes, but you know, as find as many as necessary. Some people may stick a few more in for. Um, um, just their own administrative purposes. And my recommendation, and I use this as my private practice too, by the way, is I use it, I do like using, and again, I'm not with, I may be with the Stone Age still here, but I like to have out there a list of codes that either will pop up on my computer more frequently or will be on a sheet of paper. And I like it to be the codes that I'm most likely to use more frequently. And they really, for most situations, do start narrowing down to a smaller bunch of codes than you would ordinarily have there. Um, okay, abbreviations, NEC. I only wondered about this before I gave these lectures. The definition is no code specific to the condition, and NLS means it's unspecified, and the coder uses it when he or she lacks the information needed to code more accurately. Okay, and then of course it's pretty obvious, primary diagnosis followed by the rest. The primary diagnosis is always the chief complaint for the visit. I already told you, code coexisting conditions when relevant and chronic conditions that won't apply. Do not code a diagnosis as part of the visit if it's not being treated or doesn't affect care. And again, this is all pretty obvious here, you can read it yourself, just, you know, Figure out why you're seeing the person, go through the book, look at the main term, read notes, look for modifiers, choose a tentative code and add appropriate fourth and fifth digits. You're not going to spend your time doing that. The coder is. And that's why I said I find super bills to be very useful. Because on the super bill, I've already done that for myself. I've gone through my ICD-9 book. I see a population of some perimenopausal women, for example, I see men who have some issues with uh, andropause. So there are codes that I put on my bill that won't be on someone else's bill, but I certainly wouldn't have to be looking it up every single time I, uh, I see a patient that I'm not automated enough to have my system do that for me. I'd like you to take a look at this next page, slide number 29. This is a slide of symptom listing. As you can see, Basically, mostly talking about pain or symptoms referable to those areas, and there are a lot of them. And as you can see here, if someone has, you know, um, pain in their hip, hand, foot, ankle, knee, you don't go and say they have internal derangement knee. If someone has pain in their wrist, you don't say rule out carpal tunnel syndrome or carpal tunnel syndrome. You say someone has wrist pain. Because until you know they have something else, that's all they have. And as I probably said three times on least, because I'm a total 
obsessive about this, and I talk a lot about how to optimize um, work management injury in my musculoskeletal course, to go give someone a diagnosis when all they have is a symptom is, in my opinion, again, I can get a little nuts about this, nothing short of criminal, because you're, you're branding someone with something that might not be appropriate, and which then begins to drive the care that that person gets. So if you have hand pain, I'm going to say you have hand pain, and that's the way it goes. All right. Z codes. These are the general categories of Z codes that I think are kind of interesting, obviously. Z10 to 9T is not going to be used that much, but will be used sometimes. Um, 20 to 29, reproduction and development. Rarely are going to be using one of those codes, depending with your live born infant. On the other hand, parasites with condition affect influencing health status. You're going to see that code, or you can use those codes a lot more than you think you can, and they're very interesting sometimes. They provide a lot of information to the person reviewing your file just by looking at the code. Same thing for specific procedures in aftercare, health services in other circumstances, um, which is when you're getting, um, getting certificates, et cetera, done, and then the diagnoses encountered during exam and investigation of individual populations. I'm going to see that more used in association with our surveillance examination. Here are some decodes that I think are particularly cool and or relevant to OCMED. And if you read down this list of codes, you can certainly see why I've chosen these. There's a lot, and there are more of them, by the way. I just didn't want to go fill slide after slide of codes. But, you know, look through these situations and you'll say, like, you can be, you can be pretty clear that when you're D15.84 exposure to asbestos, and 15.85 is exposure to other potentially, ha potentially hazardous body fluids, you're going to probably see a bunch of other codes around there that have to do with other exposures that might be interesting or relevant to your given situation. These are V codes that I think are a real hoot because I think they tell a lot about a patient and quite frankly, they often explain to somebody why that patient is taking so much longer to take care of than we would have expected that person to take care of. And again, if you read through these, basically dissatisfaction, litigation, person feigning illness. I mean, I don't know how many of you knew that that code was actually there, but it is. Um, I don't use it that often, but it's still there. When someone's getting counseling, if someone's getting a certificate, like a DOT certificate, if they're getting an examination for administrator's purpose. I mean, again, these are very, very interesting codes, and they can be used in different ways. Okay. So the, v, the ones I want to explain in particular, health exams of defined population. Here we're really talking about your health examinations, your pre-employment screening, and when you look at immigration, students, refugees, prisoners, et cetera, um, the 70.3 code, and to remind you of what that is, general medical examination for administrative purposes, that's really more for people. Um, 70.5 is for those who get regular screening. 70.3 is more for someone coming in for just one administrative service and it might be used for a DOT certification, immigration, naturalization. It might be used for return to work, fitness for duty, disability, or post offer examinations. 70.4 is examination for medical legal reasons. In this situation, I'm not talking about a deposition or an IMA. I'm talking about people who are coming in for blood alcohol tests, drug tests, urine screens, and this can be the primary diagnosis. So the person can obviously be sent to an MRO just for um, the um, blood alcohol test whatsoever. And whether the Medicare would pay for it or not, obviously the person who contracted for you or contracted with you for your services would be paying that bill. The medical certificates are, again, death, fitness, and capacity. And you usually get a certificate because you're getting something administratively evaluated previously to that, and at that point you're getting a certificate. Um, and you might 
be able to stick that on to an impairment and disability rating as one of the ICD-9 codes? Um, is it really relevant? Should it be done? I don't know. I'm just giving you ideas here. To return and to work in disability examinations. These are people who've had an active medical problem. Um, you code the primary diagnosis, provisional symptoms, and other diagnoses. They then get a secondary code because they need to get some kind of a release usually to go back to what they were doing, and if necessary, their employer may request that you do um, or fill out some kind of paperwork or give them a certificate which basically says they can go back to work or whatever, and that's when you would use the code V68.0. Uh, I mean, as I said previously, 70.5 is done for um, surveillance examinations. Usually they're more preventative. There are requirements for the employer and for the, for looking at the healthy worker. Um, relevant administrative codes, then to summarize them, look at these slides, you can see on the left, there's a whole bunch of things that would be ICD-9 diagnoses you would give. And on the right, by the way, there's a lot of times these are being done in conjunction with surveillance. Um, when you use your preventive medicine codes, which I am not going to spend time on today, really, because we just don't have that kind of time, just remember that when you use those codes, they're broken down by age of the worker because the, issue, the concept being that preventive medicine services at different age groups are more important than other factors involved. All right, E-codes. E-codes are for external causes. Here again is a list of causes that might be sometimes relevant to the occupational medicine environment, railway accidents. Um, I happen to like to go a third of the way down or half the way down, because I like the way it sounds. E870 to 876 is misadventures to patients during surgical and medical care. I just like the term misadventures. I find it very amusing. Anyhow, but again here, there are codes that could cover a lot of reasons why someone gets injured at work. Here's a more broken down list of e-codes that might be relevant. And as you can see, when you start getting more and more into the section, you know, hypodermic needle is cause of accident, overexertion and strenuous movements from pulling, lifting, and pushing. And how many times do we see that? And, and it goes on and on and on. I don't have time to go through them all. In terms of the low back, I just want to show you how many different codes you could use for the low back. I've actually been sometimes baffled as to what the difference is between them all. For example, you know, lumbago versus other unspecified back problem or back ache unspecified. I've never fully understood what the difference is, but there, there, there they are if you want to use them. Um, interesting codes, 3069, physiologic malfunction arising from mental factors unspecified. Good to use for your very difficult to manage patient who is giving you a lot of psychosomatic problems. Then there's psychogenic pain, psychogenic backache, which means it's all coming from their head as far as you're concerned. Um, 304 is opioid type dependence. 300.82 is undifferentiated somatoform disorder. And 300.5 is neurasthenia, which for those of you who are old enough to remember this, is basically unused to characterize a state of malaise, not feeling well, et cetera, that was at one point at least used more to characterize women than men. Since then, we've changed it with the things like Epstein-Barr, chronic fatigue syndrome, or whatever the case may be. Um, if you're sending someone back to work, this is an example of how you could use a bunch of codes that give a lot of information about the person. Well, back pain is why they came in. It's a disability evaluation now. They're picking up a certification to return to work. And the original problem was caused by overexertion and strenuous movements. Um, if someone's on work with comp and a follow-up patient, you might have to be putting in other occupational circumstances like work dissatisfaction someone who's not doing as well as you'd expect them to do. Um, if there are other conditions affecting their health status, might need to put that in. And then again, overexertion and strenuous movements would still be the cause of the original problem. And then, of course, I don't want you to forget these exciting codes, legal circumstances, unspecified psychosocial, 
person feigning illness, etc. Because frankly, the codes are there. And sometimes the real problem that this particular patient is taking you an hour versus 15 minutes is because these codes are relevant. And in that type of situation, it behooves you to put the codes down so the insurance carrier knows what's going on. Okay, let's move on to CPT coding. Back to that piece of paper that I showed you. We now have different colors, but the box on the far left in green is where you put the diagnosis from the ICD-9 that was seen above. Um, the um, red box is where you put CPT codes, and the the blue box on top is where you actually list your ICD-9 codes. As I told you previously, the idea is to, in the green section, basically link what's in the blue section to the red section in a way that explains what's going on to the insurance carrier. Um, again, look for the codes. Now that say what you're doing and just justify the what with the why. All right, again, the CPT book has a lot of different sections. The one that we're going to spend the most time with is the evaluation and management section. Um, when you when you do a code, pick a code, you're, sorry, let me just, I'm sorry, I'll take a, I'll plug up my phone. Um, your procedural and service code should match the encounter. You're encouraged to be specific. Um, this is kind of interesting because sometimes you can't be specific. Um, the codes are five digits, and sometimes you can add two modifiers to that, and I'll show you. And the modifiers are usually found in Appendix A of the book. In case you don't know this, we were on CP9, C9, and we're now on CP210. And there really aren't that many drastic changes that are going to be relevant to us. Um, for the E&M codes, they're broken into these sections. The only ones I really care about here are the outpatient office visits and consultations. Um, to some extent, the preventive medicine case management and special E&M services may also be of use. When you're making a decision process, the first thing you need to ask is, is this a new patient? That's because, and this is totally bizarre, there's a three patients rule, three year rule, which basically says that a patient who's being seen by anyone in the same specialty by as he or she was seen previously, can never be coded as a new patient. They have to be coded as an established patient. On the other hand, when you read the paper and work in front of the CPT, nine, 10, 10 book, for example, it points out in the emergency room, you don't make that distinction. Well, we also don't make that distinction very frequently in occupational medicine. In fact, as a rule of thumb, most insurers don't want us to make a differentiation um, by, by, by um, not calling someone a new patient. They want every new injury to be a new patient, which in many ways is how the workers' compensation, you know, how the, um, yeah, how the occupational medicine system works. And quite frankly, in terms of why they can't make some changes in this book, it's always annoyed me as to why the AMA just can't stick one line saying, in the emergency room and in certain circumstances, such as the care of workers' compensation patients, you um, don't follow the new patient rule. Because it leads to some confusion, especially since the CPT book tends to warn of dire consequences if you don't follow their rules. So here you are seeing a new patient. You know your customer, the insurer, wants you to call a person a new patient. The CPT book says it basically you're not allowed to do that, and in fact, it's absolutely wrong to do that. But I would say in this situation, reality trumps the book, and unless your state has a different rule, if a new, pa if a new injury is a new patient, a new injury is a new patient. Um, there are three to five levels of E&M services. They're not interchangeable per category, and basically the category depends on what you do, which makes sense and they're generally based on face-to-face -face services. There are two ways to select codes. There's something called the standard, which is way of code selection, which is based on three components, and then three what are called contributory components can provide information that can help you get to a certain key component or can better explain what you're doing sometimes. 
in terms of whether something would take a lot of time, for example, or time-based. And time-based codes are used when over 50% of the visit involves counseling and or the coordination of care. Time-based coding is exclusive of non-face-to-face time. In other words, it only counts when you're looking at the person, and I always say, you're going to spend a lot of time with that person in your office doing stuff for them. I would much rather you do it once they're in the room than out of the room, because you can bill for the time they're in the room. As soon as they walk out of the room, you can't bill for that time anymore. That time doesn't count as part of your encounter, even though in reality, you're still time you're spending taking care of that patient. Um, your three key components are history examination and medical decision making. Your contributory components are counseling, coordination of care, and nature of presenting problems. When you start looking at the contributory components, what I find most frequently is that the nature of the presenting problem can basically affect the medical decision making, which then can boost that one up. So the contributory component of that, that particular one really can affect the use of the key components. When you start doing counseling and coordination of care, they can likewise affect what's going on, but not really as much as that nature of uh, that um, nature presenting problem uh, contributory component can. All right. When you look at the history, the key components are, and this is in your initial codes when you see them, not your follow-up codes. 99202 is problem focused. 99203 is expanded problem focused. Um, they both have a chief complaint and a brief history of present illness. The difference is whether you go into the pertinent review of systems or not. There's your detailed um, initial examination, which has more information in your HPI, more information in your ROS, and pertinent past medical, family medical, and social history. And then there's your comprehensive, and you can see that it's just more, more of everything else, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Okay, in terms of medical decision making, medical decision making basically reflects the complexity of establishing a diagnosis and or selecting a management option. So as you can see, it's both sort of a before and after kind of situation. It reflects how hard it is for you to decide what's going on and then also how hard it is for you to decide what you're going to do in terms of managing that person. That includes, and then you also look at the amount and or complexity of medical records, tests, and other information that had to be reviewed for this, the risk of significant complications, morbidity and mortality, as well as comorbidities. And this is very important because that actually is one of your key contributing factors. And then the other one is basically um, the risk of comorbidities. And you only look at the information that's relevant to the encounter. Um, medical decision making can be broken into four categories. They are right here on the paper. And basically, in each category, two out of three elements associated with the category has to be met for you to use it. So if you imagine a grid, which you're going to actually see in front of you in a few minutes, what I'm basically saying is when you Choose the code. You're looking at the history, you're looking at the physical examination, and you're basically looking at the medical decision making. And these are the three key factors that are going to be affecting what code you choose to use. And here's the grid I was promising you. As you can see here, um, depending on whether you have a very straightforward situation in terms of management, in terms of the amount and or complexity of data, and in terms of risk or complication, sorry, risk or complication in NNM, um, it ranges anywhere from minimal to high. The higher it goes, the more complex your decision making is felt to be, which makes obvious sense here. Um, again, I told you that um, there's a difference between initial patients and follow up patients. In initial patients, all three components are needed. Is that a new patient? I don't care about hospital care in the ER. Otherwise, you need to satisfy or exceed two of the three components, and this again is in terms of the ENM code for seeing a patient. I spoke about contributing problems as being interesting, of, rather 
of the nature of the resenting problem as being interesting here as a contributing component as it relates to decision making. Well, the nature of the presenting problem can help support the rationale for the type of the decision making. Um, because, you know, decision making is based on thought processes, choices versus interventions, et cetera, and it's basically based upon this as needed to outcome out optimize outcomes and also on the risk of morbidity and mortality due to the problem itself if left untreated and or not treated adequately. And counseling and coordination are pretty straightforward. And they only count time spent face to face. And if it's not face to face, you can try to use case management codes or you can somehow get the person into the office with you. In other words, what I'm saying is since the telephone use is considered to be part of your visit, um, but you can also code based on time. If you're going to spend half an hour on the phone with somebody and not get paid a penny, it's a lot better to bring them into your office, um, talk to them that way, and get paid for half an hour of counseling and or coordination time. Um, I have private patients who unwittingly try to do it all the time. All right, you're presenting problems. Minimal. Um, this again is not at your established visits. This is at this is for your established visits. A physician needs to be there, not really, but the service is supervised. For example, someone comes in to get their tetanus shot after an injury, or to get their blood drawn when they're being screened for HIV. The physician doesn't have to be there, but there's generally some kind of supervision somewhere in the place. And for that, you use 99211. If it's a self-limited or minor problem that's expected to have a definite and prescribed course, almost regardless of what you do, you use 99212. And frankly, that's a lot less frequently than you think in the workers' compensation world. Um, on the low severity, your risk of morbidity without treatment is low. Um, I'm sorry, your moderate severity. Your risk of the mortality or mobility with mobility without treatment is moderate, or there's a questionable prognosis, or there's a high probability of functional impairment. What's very interesting is this terminology that I'm using is basically termination, terminology that comes from the description of the contributing component um, as opposed to nature of the problem. Whereas you can see here when you start going to the whole part about level of decision making, the nature of the problem is one of the factors you're going to be looking at, and the nature of the problem, which is a contributory factor, has to do with your risk of morbidity or mortality without treatment. Well, if you think about it, morbidity and mortality, we're not talking about things that are always objectively demonstrable. We feel at ACOM, or at least I feel at ACOM, that it's better for someone to go back to work. We feel it's better to not be hooked on drugs. We feel a lot of situations. So if you see someone who at the time of their first or second visit is walking in and you attach one of those nasty V codes about dissatisfaction, work or faintness and illness, et cetera, well, that's someone whose risk of morbidity or mortality um, without treatment is there. It's there because how they're handling the disease. It's there because of the legal and the psychosocial circumstances involved. So a lot of times, just by discussing the fact, and I've seen docs do this, by the way, in this particular patient, the risk of morbidity or mortality without treatment is moderate. At that point, they've automatically brought themselves to a moderate severity level of medical decision making. So that's where that contributing problem or that contributing component um, that, that the nature of the problem really is one that you can use, but you should definitely put the lingo in there if you're going to be using it to justify a code. Here are all the different things that can happen with counseling. I'm not going to go into them because I don't have tons of time, although we did start late, so I have more time than one thinks I have. Um, and then here's time. Time is pretty straightforward. If you spend more than 50% of your time face-to-face -face with somebody, then you can consider time as the key or controlling factor. This does include time spent with those who have some responsibility for patient care or decision making. So you can probably count your visit with the rehab nurse 
under the time component if you can't find any other way to, to make up for the fact that this person just spent 45 minutes of your time and they're billing their boss for it and you can't bill anybody. So that's where you can do the billing here. Okay, new patient. I said in new patient you need to make three or reach three out of three of your benchmarks. I have here what the benchmarks are. You can see the time that's involved on the far right. Some of you may think the time's ridiculous. Unfortunately, when you have a very difficult patient, doesn't want to go back to work, all kinds of issues, that time spent face to face does often become the driving factor in terms of how you end up doing it, even though you'd rather not be spending an hour with someone. You just end up having to spend the hour because of the particular situation at hand. Uh, as you can see here as well, when you start looking at your new patients and pay very close attention to this, when you look at 99204 and 99205, they both require that you take a, a comprehensive history and they both require that you take a comprehensive physical examination. However, on 99204, the decision making is moderate, 99205 is high, and the rest of this you can read as well as I can. Um, for your established patients, it's a little bit different, and as you can see, I'll just scroll back from one to the other. All of a sudden, your history does not need to be comprehensive for the nine, for the, for the four level. 99214 is detailed history for, for established patient, comprehensive history for new patient. Likewise, your physical examination is detailed for your established patient. Oops, wrong direction here. And it's not that high for your, uh, it's, it's um, comprehensive for your new patient. Your decision making likewise becomes, I'm not really good with this, okay. Your decision making likewise changes accordingly. So when you have a new patient, not only, a uh, follow up patient, not only are your benchmarks lower in terms of whether you need to meet two versus three of the markers, but even the markers themselves change for different levels of code. So don't just go assuming that your 99212 code is analogous to your 99202 code, and certainly your 99205 code is not analogous to your 99215 code. They're different in terms of what they require. They're different in how you can use them, which basically means you can code higher a lot of times for a follow-up visit than you can for the initial visit. Consultation codes, very straightforward. They're there, use them, or have your consult use them. It's very important as a consultant, or if you're being a consultant, you've got to be dictating or providing some kind of a letter. Sometimes, quite frankly, since I was the leading OSMED doctor at my clinic, and in fact, I was the only one who was board certified, um, I actually took the approach, especially when a client wanted someone to switch over to me, if I was acting as a consultant, so I wasn't the primary, and I actually told the person that, I'd write a letter, and I'd bill under a consultant code, which is usually going to be higher than billing under your evaluation and management code. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on prolonged services, but basically it's when your face-to-face -face services are more than usual, and it's basically something that's being added on to your E&M codes. You really can't even use the modifier of the code if the excess time is um, more than 30 minutes. Um, if it's under 15 minutes past the first hour, I think 60 minutes is the longest you can go, you just don't report it. Um, the actual codes you can use are 99354 and 99355 for 30 minutes. There are other ones for longer periods of time. There's also a modifier, which I believe is a, I might be spacing out, it's coming up later on. A 2 1 modifier that you use, um, you can just stick at the end of it if it's under 30 minutes. Um, prolonged services are 2 1, yeah, okay. Um, there's also a code you use for a prolonged procedural service. Let's say it's taking you longer to do a procedure than it should have, and the idea is the same thing. Likewise, for non face to face services, it's the same situation. I recommend you avoid these codes because you get paid nothing for them. If you have to spend that much time with somebody, I would recommend you make a visit and have them come back the next day because you will never get the money you want to get back from using these codes. 
case management codes. Well, there are a lot of case management codes, and there's phone line codes, and there's an online medical evaluation code, and they're also wonderful because you see these codes, and you get really excited, and you think, wow, I can go when I talk to people about this. I can go for phone calls. I can go for this and that. Well, guess what? The codes are in the book. There's no dollar value associated with them, and to my knowledge, they very rarely get paid. The situation when they get paid is when you've struck a deal with an employer that they want this level of service from you in terms of phone calls, whatever the case may be, and that once a month they'll let you bill for a team conference code. And by the way, this includes when you have to go sit there with the case manager for an hour, you're not going to get paid for under a team conference code. If you find that a particular client of yours is egregious in terms of doing this all the time to you, I think you have to have a conversation with the client about it because a lot of times the person who's walking into the door with the patient, the rehab nurse, et cetera, is not the same as the um, billing company that's going to be reviewing your bills to downcode them, and you really have to make a deal or you can end up giving away a lot of free care. Um, I happen to like the online medical evaluation, the concept of it being there, because I do a lot of emailing with my patients, but of course it doesn't really matter because right now I can't get paid for it. However, I actually charge my private patients for it. Because given where things are going in terms of copays, et cetera, it's often cheaper for them to pay out of pocket. There may be certain situations where if the employer wants to do a lot of phone or online stuff, you can actually make some kind of deal with that person. Remember, deals can always be made separate from codes. Preventative medicine, as I mentioned previously, they're age-based, and there's a few codes about counseling and risk factor reduction, et cetera, that you might use. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on preventative medicine codes and services, because quite frankly, you're not giving a CPT code to an insurance carrier. In the use of most of these codes, which you're basically doing, if you have a contract with one of your clients, I call them employers, so it's not your employer, to give them some kind of um, set of services that are related to preventive medicine or hazard screening or whatever the case may be somehow, you usually negotiate a price or a fee schedule of prices, and the CPT code you use can be, is really irrelevant. On the other hand, as I said, a lot of people like to be able to keep good track of what goes on in their clinic. In terms of, in terms of being able to uh, see what people are doing, et cetera, and see the patient mix, and in that situation, you might want to go use the preventive medicine codes. Here are some modifiers. 21 is prolonged D&M, and that's less than 30 minutes additional. Um, longer than the highest, which is longer than the highest amount, less than 30 minutes. 25 is an additional service. That's what you bill when you can say that at the time of the visit, in addition to doing one procedure or service that has a code to it, you're doing something else that's very different um, for the same ICD-9 code. For example, if you're doing a disability examination, but you're also treating the person that day. Well, there are two separate codes. You don't use them both together. You basically pick the cheaper one and put a 2-5 modifier on it. And that way you'll get paid usually 75%. I, I'm, I may be wrong on this. For the second procedure and the full freight for the first procedure. And that obviously makes a lot of sense because there are economies of scale if you're doing more things to someone at one time. If you end up having a x-ray taken, if you actually dictate on the x-ray yourself, which a lot of orthopedists do, for example, what you then do is you end up giving the code for the diagnosis or even for the radiologic film, and then you give another code with the 2-6 on it. That's the professional component. By the way, when I say 09926, what you can also just do is put it on a separate line, and in this situation, since you're professionally reading the film, allegedly, a separate report must occur. 5-1 is when you're doing multiple procedures. So let's say someone's getting the ENM service, they're getting some injections, they're getting some other things done, 
If that's going on at the same time by the same provider, you would end up using the 51 modifier. Um, special e and services, there are a few of them, life and disability, work related to medical disability. Again, I don't have time to go through these all, but they're basically there. Um, I tend to not use these codes, and I'll show you what I do use when we do this kind of work, because there's no number associated with them. And when you use codes with no number associated with them, you're always basically at the mercy of the insurance carrier. Um, I'm just going to go skim through this because it's a little later than I wanted. In terms of the physical medicine and rehab codes, um, they're the ones for the evaluations. Um, you can bill under one of these various codes for modalities. If you look in the book, it tells you what code goes with each modality. But just remember that the 970329 codes require that there be constant attendance. I've done a lot of duplication review work, by the way, so that's when I got really interested in coding. Um, 97110 through 7446 require one-to-one -one contact, and there are, again, a lot of treatment procedures. There are some codes that you yourself can build in your office, 97504, which is for orthotics, fitting, and training, 97535, which is for self-care and home management instruction, and um, 97545 slash 6, which is for work hardening, work conditioning, your first two hours and afterwards of those codes. Notice the ones that are in italics. These are the ones I think that you could very easily justify if you're going to be doing this as part of your clinic, billing as a separate CPT code to reflect what you're doing for a patient. And, of course, this is a situation there where you put that 2-5 modifier on it because you're primarily doing one thing, but you're also having someone fit them for crutches and show them home exercises, et cetera. And a lot of times I think physicians tend to just give these services away. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones, um, range of motion testing, muscle testing. I've done a lot of you all work in my time, and if you're one of those clever guys who's thinking about putting it as a separate item of your physical examination, um, think again because that's part of your physical examination of a patient with an injury and it's called unbundling, so you can't use it in conjunction with an E and M code. Manipulation, all I want to say is that there's all different codes there depending on how many body parts you manipulate, et cetera. It varies from ortho to chiro. I'm neither. If I ever needed to know them, I'd look them up. And again, this is a situation where if you want to use them with E and M, and they do, with that 2-5 modifier, the um, doctor needs to show that services were provided other than the chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation. In other words, what else did you do? Did you discuss work activities? Did you give them medications? Did you set up a consult? Don't have to do much. You have to do something more than just manipulate the person. Here are some more um, codes here, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, well, Dr. Genovese, I think you realize that you've got about less than five minutes to complete. Yep, I do, and I'm going to go whip through this here. Um, here we have the health risk, etc., et cetera. Et cetera. Um, surgery. Now, there's a whole bunch of slides on surgery, and this is where we suddenly gained 30 slides, because I have no intention of going over all these slides, except very briefly. All I'm going to say here is that there's something called the surgical package, and basically that includes your care before and afterwards, unless you're doing something different. That's not just the surgical work itself at each time. Um, read the slides. That's all I need to tell you here. You really don't need to have me read them to you because they're very complete. Um, and really what you need to do, if you do a lot of surgery in your clinic, don't even read my slides. Just open up the book and read my slides, at, or read the book using my slides as a guide. Um, a few things, if you do two procedures, there's a modifier, um, and it just goes on, and I just keep going. When you do closures, I want you to remember that depending on ha what the site involves and depending on the complexity of the closure, you're going to be using different codes. Again, the surgical codes are pretty. Um, detail that way, you have to measure the types of wounds in the different body parts, 
And if there are multiple wounds in the same category, like scalp, you add the length. If different types, you just have to then say, okay, I did one of this type of wound, and then for this one, you use that modifier 51 I mentioned. Remember I said that you're doing multiple procedures? Well, that's when you use your modifier 51. There's a dash 51, usually when you're doing surgery. There's things for debridement, and again, I'm just going through these all. You can sort of read them on your own, or you can read them in the book. I'm just showing you the options that are there. Um, musculoskeletal, basically if it's open treatment, it means you need to be looking at the cast. Um, quite frankly, rather than even doing the closed treatment kind of situations, it's my recommendation you basically, um, since the, the physician who applies the cast assumes all the subsequent injury, um, you know, gets involved in a lot of kind of things. I personally think it's better to just buy your splint, get your payment using the code I mentioned previously for putting the splint on, and then go from there. There's a whole bunch of different codes for injections, for taking care of the eyes, um, for the auditory system. And again, I know I'm just going through the slides here, but I just wanted to show you where to look to read. And I think that's better, as I just don't have time to do, read them all myself, basically. Uh, visual function screening, remember that that is not something that can be done together with looking at visual acuity. And generally, if you have E&M eye care, you cannot bill for visual screening unless there is a very clear, that's part of your care. If you just have an eye injury, you're screening their eyes. Thank you very much. What would you be doing? Screening their feet? No, you can't build separately, so I have a lot of common sense. There's some audiometry, venopuncture, cardiograms, administration, as you can see, depending on how many vaccines you give, how you give it, and what's going on with it. You can certainly go for, um, for vaccines. You can go for all your blood and breast alcohol testing. So putting it together, here we go. Usual care. There are these items, i.e. usual meaning in the world of non-workers' compensation. Workers' compensation care, on the other hand, we have other things going on. We have a causation assessment. We have the need to complete a physical capacities evaluation and discuss it with the employer. And we need to use case management and care coordination. These are all then coding issues, i.e., how do we get paid for these when they're are either no codes for them or no codes they pay money for them, which is basically like not getting paid for them. Um, well, number one, you have to look at the complexity of care. And when you look at that decision making, these people are definitely more complex. You can sometimes base your coding on time. And again, this is really a recap. Building independently for your phys, you know, for your PCE and for your cause and things you can try. You can try everything. Will you get it? No, but if you don't try it, you're not going to know that. Um, basically, um, use the current system. Get a good history. I actually would have patients complete a history form. I have them write their history on the form. I would justify in most cases that I need to get a pretty complex history so they're a workers' compensation person. They may have other diseases. I don't, I don't know about that because I'm not their ordinary doctor someone with a laceration, they have a murmur I don't know about. So really, I need to know a lot about this person because it's not someone who I'm routinely seeing. So I can justify that. Generally, to boost the level of history, I also can do a very thorough examination because, quite frankly, I think if you're examining a back, for example, you're looking at a lot, nervous system, other kinds of movement, et cetera. So I, and it really, frankly, guys, it doesn't take that long to perform a thorough examination compared to a less star examination. And when the differences are going to be $140 in what you get paid or $100 in what you get paid, I think it really does behoove you to take that extra time. And again, I'm reminding you here, however, that for new patients, you've got to be comprehensive by level four in terms of your history and physical, and your decision level has to be high by level five. Even though I've been fairly aggressive with coding, I very rarely use 99205 for a claimant. Um, I really do. I tend to stick to it no higher than 99204 if they have a back problem or if they have any kind of reasonably um, more than just put a Band-Aid on you kind of musculoskeletal problem. Um, the 99205 code I think I'm using for someone with multiple body parts, 
lots of work, work stuff going on and a lot of risk factors that make me think they're going to be difficult to take care of. And remember, in terms of your history, you have a lot of things to put in there, all those asterisks that are not going to be, that are not going to be part of a regular progress note in the non-workers' compensation world. Again, for new patients, I, I don't know why the slide's here, before we'll pass on it. Okay, so to show you that for established patients, you only need to be the detail level as a consequence for a lot of my patients, with any kind of other than extremely simple problem, we're usually at 99213 to follow up, sometimes 99214. If I have a back patient, I'm sorry to pick on back or carpal tunnel patient or whatever, you're giving me a really hard time by getting them back to work and there are all kinds of issues. Invariably, I may also end up at the 99215 level. Just document what's going on and put some of those V codes in there. So then the insurance carrier says, oh, this is a tough situation. Okay, this form is very self-explanatory. And my problem is, and now it's Paul's problem too, is that he picked up my problem, is there are all these things we see that we have to do that we can't go for, like form completion. Putting that TCE form, you know, Jennifer, Christian, and me and other people give this long song and dance about how we should do such a great job, but how can you do such a, you know, but then you don't get paid for it. Um, causation analysis. You can maybe use it as a time basis or for complexity. Job offer review, these are some codes you might want to use. That 9499 enlisted service, look at that carefully. Case manager, I already told you, you generally can't bill for it. It's not part of face-to-face -face service. My, my belief is keep everybody in the room, keep everybody there. If they want to talk to you, they should talk to you there. Because all of a sudden you can bill for them. In terms of in-person discussions, I told you the case management code is that 99361 is going to get you no money. Likewise, the phone calls don't get you paid, so have them come in rather than call. Again, this is all review. Site visits, you can use that 99358. I use 99199, which is unlisted special service procedure or report. Whenever you use a 99 code, you generally get 80% of what's felt to be the UCR for that. Um, in terms of disability issues, there's really no guidance in how to look at them. In terms of IMEs, again, I'd rather just do something with a 99 at the end of it and do it that way. So I'm just going over the codes with you, and I'm saying if you're doing a lot of range of motion in terms of an impairment rating, you can add on a 97750, which is the range of motion code, in addition to what you're doing to justify it. Bill for all ancillary services. Use these miscellaneous codes, they're across the bottom. Um, if it's non I told you again, if it's non workers' compensation, it probably doesn't really matter. Here's what you do for drugs and alcohol. Caveats, you know, billing doesn't equal care. If you're going to make changes, discuss it with your client, or they're going to get mad at you. If clients are usually negotiated, use the coding guidelines to clarify what you're providing and to justify, you know, what, what you want to get for it. Transcription, I think transcription is very useful, or how they have these new computer programs, because basically you can provide a lot more information via macros, et cetera, that can then boost your progress note, lets you provide more information, and doesn't take your time for doing it. And if you're going to do any kind of change, of course, you need to implement your staff and let them going on. So in summary, there are problems with ICD, CCT, and getting a consensus from payers. ACOM should have a position, which we actually do, but in the interim there should be a uniform means of handling coding, and we really don't know what it is. And at this point, um, this is kind of, I don't know how I, I repeated those slides. So we are done. Sandy? All right. Uh, Sandy, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I'm a clinician who makes his living by coding correctly. After a number of years of doing uh, this for every one of my patients, I code all my patients personally. I've discovered that I cannot delegate this to a staff member and get paid fully for everything I do. If, if my clinic was large enough to employ a certified professional coder, things might be different, but these kind of uh, experts are very expensive to hire. So in my estimation, for a clinic to be most successful, it's essential 
that every provider have an excellent understanding of coding, and that's why Elizabeth and I are here today. Thanks for joining us. My objectives for this session are that you would understand the chief differences between the ICD-9 and the ICD-10 coding systems, that you would grasp the importance of the implementation date of the ICD-10 uh, CM, and that you would understand the need to plan and budget for the switch from the ICD-9 CM to the ICD-10 CM. In 1992, the uh, uh, HICFA, better known today as uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, began requiring hospitals and medical practices to use the ICD and the CPT codes in order to be reimbursed for services. ICD, as you know, stands for International Classification of Diseases, and it's a system for coding the diagnosis. CPT stands for Current Procedural Terminology and is a system that's actually copyrighted and owned by the AMA for coding medical services. CPT codes answer the question, what do I do, while ICD codes answer, why do I do it? The ICD, uh, ICD began as a system for classifying the causes of death on death certificates from the year 1900 onwards. It's gone through 10 major revisions, and the medical establishment is currently using the 10th edition, or ICD-10, to code the causes of death on death certificates. But we're still using the 9th edition for coding the diagnoses of patients who are receiving outpatient or inpatient services. When coding inpatient or outpatient diagnoses, a modified system is used in the U.S., which is called the ICD-9-CM, or clinical, uh, for clinical modification. Again, this is a U.S.-based modification. The ICD-9-CM is based on the ICD-9, but the CM version is updated annually and has more morbidity detail in it. The ICD-9, like previous editions, uses a three-digit code to specify a general diagnosis with a fourth or fifth digit added to increase specificity. For example, the code 881 refers to an open wound of the lower arm. Adding the fourth digit, 0.2, indicates that the wound involves a tendon injury, and adding 0.22 indicates that the open wound with tendon involvement is located at the wrist. Since we've been using the ICD-10 to code for causes of death since 1999, you would have expected that the CM version would be required by now for diagnostic coding of inpatients and outpatients. Well, it appears that CMS has set a firm implementation date of October 1, 2013 for the ICD-10 CM. There are several reasons for this 14-year delay, the most important of which is that the, the ICD-10 CM is not simply a revision of the ICD-9 CM, but it's a completely different coding paradigm. The differences between the two systems are vast. But before I discuss those differences, I want you to recognize the fundamental importance of that implementation date. Presumably, healthcare entities that are now using, a uh, correction, that are not using the ICD-10 CM by that date run the risk of not getting reimbursed. Now, technically, the mandatory implementation date applies only to HIPAA-covered entities that bill CMS. But what organization tends to be the driving force be behind reimbursement policy adopted by most insurers in the U.S.? Well, CMS, of course. And what about workers' compensation systems that many of us OCDOCs or primary care providers who do OCMED re regard as our primary source of reimbursement? Well, by definition, a workers' compensation system is not a HIPAA-covered entity because in filing a claim, a worker automatically consents to the sharing of necessary information between the physician and the employer. In June 2009, CMS published a myths and facts sheet about the ICD-10 CM. Here is their statement on workers' comp systems. Myths. Non-covered entities which are not covered by HIPAA, such as workers' compensation and auto insurance companies, that use ICD-9-CM 
may choose not to implement ICD-10 CM. Fact, because ICD-9 CM will no longer be maintained after ICD-10 CM is implemented, it is in non-covered entities' best interest to use the new coding system. The increased detail in ICD-10 CM is of significant value to non-covered entities. CMS will work with non-covered entities to encourage their use of ICD-10 CM. Well, it sounds kind of ominous, don't you think, when a powerful federal agency tells your major payers that something is in their best interest and that they're going to work with them to encourage them to choose something. I think we all know that it's time to start learning the ICD-10 CM. Well, why the change? What's the motivation behind this change from the ICD-9 CM to the ICD-10? Well, our National Center for Health Statistics, part of the CDC, says that the specific improvements of the ICD-10 CM include the addition of information relevant to ambulatory and managed care encounters, expanded injury codes, creation of combination diagnosis and symptom codes to reduce the number of codes needed to fully describe a condition, the addition of sixth and seventh characters, incorporation of common fourth and fifth digit subclassifications, laterality of the body site. Uh, you know, with the ICD-9, you, you have to say right or left. Uh, it's not intrinsic to the code, whereas in the ICD-10, the code will actually specify whether it's right or left. And then the greater specificity in code assignment. The new structure will allow further expansion than was possible with the ICD-9 CM. Well, let's look at some of the differences between the two systems briefly. ICD-9 codes are three to five numbers in length, while ICD-10 are three to seven alphanumeric characters in length. The ICD-9 has V and E codes for supplementary factors and external causes that Elizabeth has touched on already, but the ICD-10 incorporates these concepts into its coding scheme. There currently exists about 13,500 ICD-9 codes, and there are currently about 68,000 ICD-10 codes, but that number can go way up because there's the numerical possibility of doing that with the new system. Well, here's how they compare side by side. In either system, you can specify a diagnosis with as few as three characters. The ICD-9 typically begins with a number unless it's an E or V code and is followed only by numbers. The ICD-10, however, always begins with a letter followed by a number, followed by numbers or letters. In both systems, codes containing more than three characters have a decimal point after the third character. This is the format of the ICD-9 currently being used. Just take a look at it, self-explanatory. Compare it to the format of the ICD-10. The primary reason that the ICD-10 currently has five times more codes than the ICD-9 is due to the increased specificity and expanded injury codes of the ICD-10. For example, consider one of the most common diagnoses we see, lumbar sprain. Most of you have memorized the ICD-9 code for lumbar sprain, haven't you? It's 847.2. Now, under the ICD-10, it's going to be a bit more complicated. To the originators of the ICD-10, by using the word sprain in association with lumbar, you have made a technical declaration that there is a sprain of the lumbar spinal ligament and you code, that according, uh, accord, you code that accordingly using code S33.5. But if you saw the patient for the first time, you put an A in the seventh digit place, or if it was a follow-up visit, you put a D. Since there are no fifth or sixth digits, you fill in those with Xs. Now, what if you diagnose a lumbar strain instead of a lumbar sprain? That is, you are technically stating 
that the lumbar muscles are strained, not that the ligaments are sprained. In that case, you would code the initial encounter as S39.012A or a subsequent encounter as S39.012D. If you're beginning to feel that this is somewhat ridiculous because you've never thought to distinguish between a lumbar ligament sprain versus a lumbar muscle strain, you feel like I do. We've always used 847.2 to code this common occupational injury, and now we are moving into a situation where we'll have to pick one of four codes. I'm sorry to have to inform you that a similar scenario will be played out for many commonly used ICD-9 codes in occupational medicine. Well, get ready for the changeover. Obviously, the impending change from version 9 to version 10 on October 1, 2013, is going to require significant pre-planning for most practices. Now is the time to develop an implementation plan because the changeover is not just a coding or IT project, it will impact business processes. Take an inventory of all ICD-9 dependent work processes, automated as well as manual, external as well as internal. Realize that the degree to which the changeover affects any particular practice is dependent on how automated they are, how many software vendors you have to deal with versus your own IT department, and what electronic medical record you use, including its future upgrades. These are the people to start talking to now, your EMR vendor or your IT department, your payers, your clearinghouse or billing service, and your professional coders if you can afford to use them. You will want to verify their awareness of the impending changeover, their plans for the changeover, and how they will support you. You will want to keep tabs on how their readiness is progressing, and you will want to test every affected system well before October 1, 2013. Finally, you will want to plan for your staff to be trained by identifying who simply needs awareness training versus intermediate versus in-depth training. This changeover to the ICD-10 is going to be far-reaching and it's going to cost your practice to implement it. So you will need to budget for those implementation costs. I suggest you also have a post-implementation review to ensure that your implementation has been successful. The month of October 2013 is going to be nightmarish for many practices. Don't be caught unprepared. Begin preparing now. And I'd like to uh, just point out something I read just yesterday in a, uh, in a, a practice management journal. Um, this says that uh, for, the, for the typical pr practice, the changeover from the ICD-9 to the ICD-10 is going to cost a typical three-doctor practice $84,000 in training, software upgrades, jammed up insurance claims, and increased documentation costs. And honestly, plan to have a real delay in payments coming in beginning in October 2013. Have some money saved up. That's all I had to say, and I think uh, Elizabeth uh, has something to say about the CME questions. Do I? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I think something else. Um, yeah, I, I thought Sandy was going to ask them. Yes, at this point we'll address the CME questions so the, the webinar qualifies for continuing education credits. Uh, Dr. Genovese, can you please... Uh-oh, uh no, I just completely lost. Uh-oh. I completely lost track of where I was. I'm sorry. That's okay. Let's just get computer now. Okay, I've got. Let me get to that slide so that I can read you the questions. I've got it right here. Patient evaluation. Okay, I found them. Yep. New okay, patient. new patient evaluation management codes differ from codes for existing um, existing patients in they. A cannot use time as a factor justifying choice of a given level of service. Two can generally be used every five years for a given provider or group of similar providers. 
Um, C required that three out of three rather than two out of three key factors be met to justify use of a given level of service. D have restrictions in terms of initial use that are not explicitly described in the CPT coding literature and are not applicable to workers' compensation patients or choice B and D. Um, do they give me the answer? Do I give them the answer, Sandy? I you can go ahead and say the answer. The answer is C. Um, the first part, remember, they can use time. They can be used every three years. Um, they, but they do require that three out of three rather than two of key factors be met. And the restrictions in terms of initial use are described in the CPT literature, but unfortunately they're not applicable. And uh, they, they don't include that they're not applicable to workers' compensation patients only that they're not applicable to emergency room patients. Um, next one is one can justify coding a higher level of service for a workers' compensation patient as compared for a person for whom return to work is not an issue based upon all of the following except time spent with the patient, increased risk of morbidity and or functional outcome, the time spent speaking with the employer, making arrangements for modified duty after the patient leaves, discussion of return to work issues with the patient, and the need to acquire historical information that might not otherwise be needed. And obviously, you're going to choose the higher level of service. Um, you can do it with time spent, because that's face-to-face. -face. I already told you that increased risk of morbidity or poor functional outcome is one of your contributing factors and can be used to justify your coding. If you talk to the employer and make arrangements after the patient needs, it is not face-to-face, -face, so you can't do it. On the other hand, if you sit there and discuss return to work issues with the patient, which I implied, of course, was face-to-face, -face, in that kind of situation, you certainly can justify billing for a high level of service. And then I said, which of the following codes can be used together providing that a modifier is employed even when the same ICD-9 code is used for both encounters and the choices were manipulation in E&M codes, surgical procedures in E&M codes, um, disability assessment and evaluation in management codes, and visual screening and uh, evaluation in management codes. I've already, remember I told you that you cannot use visual screening and E&M codes together? I already specifically told you that. I told you that you that um, you can um, I'm sorry here that you can use surgical procedure and evaluation and management codes together when you're doing different things. Um, I also said you could use um, manipulation and evaluation and management codes. So basically, I'm sorry. The answer to this really should be um, it's A and C. It's E, A, and C. So there we go. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Genovese. I'm going to, I know that we're a little over time, but I'm going to have you address just two quick questions. The first being, um, if a nurse does a resident. You can answer questions for a while. I don't care. <laughs> if a nurse does a respiratory evaluation, how is this coded, specifically E and M? Respirator evaluation. That's a sitting for a respirator. Um, you're not really treating a problem there, actually. Um, and I'm not, you know, you're not, it's not really a, it's not a treatment. You know, like, there's no, there's no, there's no so I, I think of that, I think that would be, I'm not sure how you code for that. I wouldn't use this, I wouldn't think of it using a CPT code unless, uh, unless Paul has a suggestion there. Yeah, we, uh, all our respirator evaluations are by contract with em employers. We don't even use CPT codes for those. It's just uh, an agreed upon uh, fee. That's what I mentioned earlier. Remember I said a lot of the stuff that we're not going to go through because you just decide what you're going to charge. You know, I'm going to go have you, you know, and it's not, so, you know, E and M, evaluation and management code, by definition means you're evaluating and managing a medical problem. A respirator fit is just something like, you know, seeing if you can get a respirator to fit properly and all the other stuff you do with the respirator fit. So it's really not a medical treatment service when you think about it. And I think that's what you always have to keep in mind. Is this a treatment that you're doing? 
and you're really not doing a treatment in that kind of scenario. Well, thank you. And finally, Dr. Darby, can you comment, where can I go to get resources to help me with the changeover? Yes, uh, there are a couple web websites that would be very helpful for people. It's, uh, first of all, it's the AMA website, uh, www.ama-assn, that's ama-assn.org. Uh, and also the American Association of Professional Coders website, which is www.aapc.com. That's www.aapc.com. Also, most state medical associations have a, uh, a coder uh, to assist practices uh, who, whose me members include uh, uh, individual docs or, or practices to help with coding. Uh, they can also be a big resource um, in individual states. Wonderful. Well, I would like to thank all of you for your attendance and the presenters for their valuable presentations. And this does conclude today's program. You may disconnect now. And Sandy, stay on the phone. I want to ask you something then, okay? Okay. Let me call you back, Dr. Genovese. Fine.